All right, guys, let's get started. So, um, yeah, I'll be talking about uh, uh, dropping assets or rather not dropping assets. So, yeah, I'll be talking about databases. I'll be talking about the CIP theorem. So, this is sort of a relatively trendy thing nowadays to talk about CIP because it allows you to go web scale and all that stuff. Uh, I'll sort of it, this talk is kind of like a really long intro, and then the real, if you really want to take something away, that's the the, the last bit of advice towards the end is how you structure when you want to understand more about uh, selecting good databases for your particular use case, how you want to go on about that. So um, a little bit of intro. Uh, we all know about the cost of dirty data, so if you mess up your data, it can be really bad depending on, on uh, your line of business. You can end up in trouble with government, lose money, you can um, make a lot of wrong decisions. Uh, but what's also uh, not very well known is I've sort of I'm trying to highlight some of the indirect costs. So when your boss comes a little bit around and says, hey, we heard that you, we, we got some bad data, and you, you're a developer, say, yeah, maybe we have a little bit. And then someone, uh, your boss asks you, well, how much? And then you go, not really sure. Um, let's, so when can you tell me? Not really sure. So it's quite, um, it's can be quite actually hard to quantify that and big serious companies like Amazon they do invest a lot of time into actually quantifying how when when sort of when you have concurrency issues and they they are consciously sacrificing um, uh, accuracy for for scalability and for for cost but you still need to quantify it and that's not easy uh, and uh, lastly, I just want to um, highlight also loss of confidence in data. So, especially if you, if anyone has worked on data warehousing projects nowadays, you have data lakes, which are kind of similar as well. But you, whenever you have a data warehousing project, what typically happens is that if a data warehouse gets a really bad reputation, there's no way that it becomes completely useless. So uh, people will not trust the the data. It's completely like the whole value is undermined, and then. Uh, you go onto another project of oh, okay, let's rebuild the data warehouse because uh, there's no, no no amount of fixing will fix the the perception. Uh, okay, a little bit of intro. Um, Acid uh, is atomicity, so that's like your database commits. Consistency is like primary key constraints for key constraints. Isolation. This is really actually um, if you if you never seen isolation levels, I will skip. I will. I'll uh, show you a few examples, but it's actually quite complicated. Your ability is just not losing your data. A bit of a stab at MongoDB. Good old MongoDB. It's improved a lot since, since 2010. Um, the cap theorem is, that was basically a theorem that sort of uh, allowed to open up the, that blew everyone's mind and open up the possibility to say, hey, if you want to go internet scale, you, you, you have to kind of make some sacrifices, and one of these sacrifices are the typical sacrifices of the, the consistency. And, and lo, lo and behold, um, uh, we have a whole bunch of new uh, database products that, that, that are based on that. Uh, the pioneers of, of the internet scale were Amazon and Google. Uh, Amazon, there was, I did some interesting re reading years ago on the Amazon DBA is talking about the issues they were having with their original Oracle database and just wouldn't scale. Uh, I mean, there were so many scalability issues because it was, uh, no one has, had used Oracle at the time at that scale. So even Oracle engineers were scratching their heads and trying to figure out what was going on. And yeah, Amazon had to migrate uh, to, to more scalable platforms. The, and it's still sort of more or less the case today. I mean. Uh, all the traditional databases, they all have limits when it comes to scalability. Uh, some of them higher than the others, you can sort of cheat a bit. Nowadays you have also um, machines with, uh, you have a processor, I think you get a 48, uh, well, I think 48, how many cores do you get now? 40 something, 48, something like that. So if you chuck in eight CPUs and 48 cores just on a single box, you can get a lot of CPU cores, right? And then, but you know, there are, there are limits to, it, there are still limits to scalability if you're just looking at hardware. And uh, the new acronym was born BASE, basically available soft state eventual consistency. 
eventual consistency means occasionally inconsistent inconsistency. So you know, there's, of course, there's there's an outside to that. So I'm going to now cover your um, NSAI SQL isolation levels. We'll talk a little bit about the isolation levels. So just get a quick raise of hands who actually knew this. Who knows? Or who who's read about these? Okay, cool. So as a developer, you should, at the very least, as the developer, you should know this. As a backend developer, right? If you're doing any backend programming, you should know this. This is not a DBA. This is not a DBA uh, problem. Just a DBA set of problems. This is like when you have transaction coming in any sort of concurrent system. You need to understand what does it mean when you have uh, threads and potentially things working against each other. Uh, so. This is your 101 NSA SQL. It's actually not that accurate. Next thing you should read is you should read the uh, 1995 paper from Microsoft that actually said uh, all of these, there's actually more, there are more isolation levels and there are more <coughs> phenomena that cause, that can cause issues, right? And this is where it gets, starts getting complicated. I'm not going to go through these now because it would take me a long time. And there are lots of people who sort of try to do it and squeeze it in half an hour, one hour, and everyone just blanks out. So take your time, sit down, start reading through them. You know, start start with the basic and as, uh, uh, examples. Open up, you know, your MySQL. Connect to MySQL. Open a few different sessions. Try three different commands in parallel, and you will actually see what's going on. You'll get a much better picture of that. Um, there are also some, um, uh, a lot of, some of the databases actually are not using proper classifications for their isolation models. For example, Oracle actually supports snapshot. You're not going to see snapshot in Oracle, but it, it is actually snapshot, uh, the, the highest consistency. So there is, you know, occasionally there are some, <coughs> even in the database world, that some of the vendors are sort of not quite accurate about what they support. Um, and, the next slide is, okay, now it's starting to get interesting. Uh, fast forward to 2013, and then a bunch of researchers figured out, hey, there's a whole bunch of other kind of isolation models. So this is just to show you, you know, it's actually pretty damn complicated. So it's, you see the, I'll explain later on what does green, red, and purple mean, but it's effectively there's, uh, all of these are kind of like, uh, the, 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 on the board, on the bottom side, you have the looser ones, and then as you, as you go up, uh, there are stricter ones where the, the strongest possible model so far has been found to be the strong, strong serializable isolation model. It means that it, it, it adheres to, it has the least amount of phenomena that you can possibly find. And if you're really into this, then you, you should read this paper as well. Um, so, Typically, I ask around, uh, like, what are your DBMS isolation levels? They have a whole lot of blank stares. Uh, I ask them people, like, what do they need to be? And a whole lot of blank stares. So then I'll, uh, another quick question. So what could you expect out of a typical microservice architecture? And the answer is you could expect nothing. So as, there's no asset in, in a very like if you're I'm talking distributed, if you're calling a few, a few dis distributed services, if you have one service, then basically you can, you can hope that whoever has implemented that service is, has got all the concurrency mechanism in place that with single service is actually a, a pretty decent isolation, it supports a pretty decent isolation level. If you have multiple services and there is any sort of uh, distribution, uh, out of the box you get nothing. So you, you don't get even atomicity, consistency integrate, uh, isol sorry, you don't get consistency or isolation or even durability. So if you need to do any, uh, this is why the distributed transactions were invented in the first place. And after a while people forgot about distributed transactions because they're actually quite hard. So people just pretend that it's not a problem, but quite often it is a problem. And I'm not saying anything against microservices. They have to, they will be here, they will stay here, but in some situations, if you're not a huge company, maybe microservices are not a, a great, it introduces a whole bunch of issues. And uh, going back to the old diagram, 
The, um, I want to add the, the last bit, which is the cognitive load of developers to understand and manage all the complexity that should be a deal managed by the DBMS. So what does this mean? So exactly, you have these blank stairs and we burn them. Uh, and um, yeah, so it will take you a long while to uh, actually understanding all these issues and how to counter them, how to mitigate them. And that all translates into, into a huge cost, potentially a huge cost to companies. So every single developer, you, you kind of expect every single backend developer to know this, otherwise you can make mistakes and a whole bunch of errors. Um, and hence Google uh, decided to try to tackle this problem, to try to actually fix, not to fix the issue, but try to basically fix it once so that individual developers who are building apps don't have to worry about all the different things that uh, that people have to worry about. So F1 is the original uh, code name for Google Spanner. And you, sh you can, I'm not going to read word for word uh, this paragraph, but it's exactly what, exactly what my point is about uh, trying to fix the issue once and not, not, not doing it over and over again. OK, now let's quickly revisit the cap theorem. Uh, what I want to talk about a little bit the cap theorem because you will make, you will hear in a lot of talks that the cap theorem this blah blah blah. So I kind of want to put that into perspective to make sure that you understand how um, what it actually means and what it doesn't mean. So um, firstly, I wanted to kind of point out the cap theorem is you have the consistency, availability, partition tolerance. So to me. Pick the odd one out. To me, the partition, firstly, partition tolerance is kind of the odd one out because it's talking about consistency and availability you can monitor from the inside. Partition tolerance is a internal kind of under the hood implementation mechanism. So it's uh, it kind of doesn't it doesn't necessarily fit the like it doesn't help you necessarily frame the the problem in the main area. But anyway, put this on the side. I'm, uh, there are other issues of using CAP for practical purposes. So firstly, is there such a thing as 100% availability? Yes, of course no. Uh, what about the latency? Uh, at, which, at, at some point, uh, high latency translates into de facto uh, lack of availability. Um, consistency, so what, which actual isolation model they're talking about? Well, it's actually linearizable. Uh, I don't know a single commercial product that supports the linearizable isolation model. So it's it's one of these relatively strict models, but it's not it's not that useful for, for practical purposes. And then when you're talking about partition tolerance, you know there are some some things to be aware of there as well. It's like the, the, the whole cap theorem is based on commodity hardware. In some cases, if you have shared storage or infinite clusters, then it's not quite. That means that the cap theorem is not necessarily applicable. So, is it actually um, completely off the mark? No, it's not. So it just means that it's the cap theorem is uh, is applicable to the. It was originally uh, the defined based on the linearizable model. Um, you can. So the, the the other the other thing to note is that this green the green area means that. It's you can actually have in theoretically you can have uh, availability and partitioning, and uh, you can put in like a lowercase c, not a capital C. So, for example, read committed falls into the green area, and read commit is your default uh, model. Actually, like if you use Oracle, the default is actually read committed. So it means that even a relatively okay uh, isolation model can, in theory, be implemented uh, to be 100% available, whatever the 100% available and and the partition tolerant. Now, there is a whole bunch of uh, new products called New SQL that are designed for scalability. And interestingly enough, they don't actually use. I haven't seen a single one that uses that sort of in the green area. So they're all actually. CP, CP systems. They're all actually CP systems. Most of them are actually strong serializable. A few of them, I think I've seen a couple that are 
uh, snapshot isolation. So even these new products, they are not designed to be like super uh, available. But what does super available actually mean? You check out Google Spanner, and they claims out you get uh, a little bit more than five nines, right? So how how many people do you think like do you know any database system, any database platforms right now commercially that have five nines? I know what, like PayPal now claims to have five nines. Uh, this one is a little bit higher than PayPal, and five nines is really really hard to implement. It'll take you years of maturity and discipline and and uh, good infrastructure and everything to actually get finance. And is it actually good enough? Well, you know, it's good enough for PayPal. You know, I'm sure PayPal would like to, to get more than that, but it's actually quite, quite okay. So this is all kind of putting into perspective, right? Um, and for a lot of companies, in like four nines it should be fine, if even less than that. So it's not, yeah, you know, there's a lot of talk about the theory, but then the practical applications can be uh, quite different. So now we are getting to the real stuff. So this is all. So how, what's actually a useful, a practically useful way of <coughs> creating a, some sort of a framework to lead you, to guide you through that a list of question of, of things you need to consider before you choose a database. Uh, and so this is this is so that you try to after this hopefully you will know what you don't know. So uh, starting from acid, do I need atomicity? Uh, data referential integrity, do I want to trade off integrity issues in production performance so you can maybe decide to have, instead of actually you can disable all your foreign keys and even primary keys and stuff and then later on what I'm going to do about this potentially dirty data. Maybe I'm going to do some validation, maybe I'm going to do some validation and, and do a bit of a damage assessment to see how, how it actually performs in practice. Uh, that means you have to put in additional effort into that. So th this is all, it's all about trade-offs, right? If you enable everything, all the, all the constraints up front, you don't have to do any of that. Uh, which isolation level do I need to use? You know, you can always turn everything off and then try to put more measures, additional measures, to either prevent things or to, or, or to do at least a damage assessment. Am I okay with losing data? Actually, a lot of a lot of high, even uh, very high-end systems occasionally they lose data, and vendors, of course, they're not going to advertise this. But um, if you actually, I'm just going to roll back. If you look at the company called Jepson.io, they've developed a suite, uh, like a testing suite, that actually tries to break, uh, that try that performs an assessment of of how the database actually performs. And these are not just databases, they also did it on Kafka, and, I mean, on, all the, on a lot of big products. And a lot of the time, under some circumstances, especially when you have, when you have, uh, uh, when you have uh, partitioning of the systems and, and some of the nodes going down, sometimes you lose data, or sometimes you lose consistency. So uh, it's really, this is a really hard topic, so don't, you know, never, trust the, the marketing material from the vendors. Um, what am I, so then we have availability and latency. So you know, I need to think how is it, what does actually availability mean? What does latency mean to me? Um, sometimes when you chain, if you have microservices architecture, depending on how the services are chained, the, the latency can increase quite a bit. So maybe you want to actually squish some of this microservices and maybe there should be mini services or even services uh, yeah depending on all of that uh, and then you want to like when it comes to scalability you really want to make a honest assessment what do I actually need you know uh, we're talking here like some big companies like PayPal and Amazon and Google but you know in reality in, in a lot of companies most applications are way smaller scalability needs than and any sort of even you know a basic MySQL uh, you know, DB engine will cover all of your needs. Um, this, uh, then there's another important thing. This is very much sort of DBA space is performance. So what sort of performance workloads should I expect? Uh, for example, Oracle is okay or good at everything, but not great at anything in particular. Whereas a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, look, I mean, this is all, it, this, these are all traders, right? Then you have some, like Cassandra is really good at these things, and the Azure is good at these things. So, 
it's if you want if you have a very specialized problem area, then you can go for a specialized product as well. But you need to understand all the different uh, like um, performance workloads, performance patterns that you need to support. Um, flexibility. Will my database schema evolve? Like, do you have like a really simple schema and it's going to stay this is pretty much the same for years? Or I'm going to like this is going to be a successful application. Any successful complex application will evolve, right? Uh, that's the that's the definition of successful apps is they they keep growing. As you start keep growing, then you have more issues in terms of managing the schema. And I have to stress there is no such thing as a schemaless database. It just means that when you, someone says schemaless database, it just means that the database does not manage the schema for you. You have to do it yourself. Okay. So I will argue this offline as well, but I'm really uh, kind of really particular about this thing. Um, uh, so what are the different pathways of accessing the data? Is if you have lots of joins, again, a lot of a lot of products don't, don't they don't support joins. If you have more complex stuff, then you're sort of going into uh, you should be looking at SQL-based products, uh, and then uh, query optimizations. Then if you have again if you have complex queries. You can optimize uh, the sort of uh, more mature products. They they have very good optimizers. Like I've I've been working on databases since almost 20 years ago, and I've sort of seen the evolution of of uh, the introduction of cost-based optimizers originally DB2 and then Oracle. And nowadays you pretty much don't have to worry about it. About 10 or 15 years ago, there were still lots of times where certain queries didn't perform well, and you had to manually optimize it. If you have a new product where you have to do all the optimization yourself, it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, data recovery and resilience. Okay, this is kind of purely boring DBA stuff. What you know? What if something goes wrong? How do you do point in time recovery, right? And it you know even it sometimes all the hardware resilience and everything you know something goes wrong, and you have to actually recover point in time. Maybe there's a, some funny virus or someone did some manual damage, and you have to actually recover point in time. And then it becomes quite important when the S hit the fan, how quickly you can do it, how, um, and are you going to lose any data? Uh, and um, also data cover resilience, like how when the hardware components fail, how resilient the whole solution is to that. Uh, standards, if I, if I decide to migrate to another DBS later on, you know, I'm going to, what's, how big is going to be the damage on the application side? Do I have to rewrite the, the, the data access layer? So someone asked me a question before, like, um, how do I know when I'm going through this list and I don't know the requirements very well? I don't know what to pick. And I, my answer was, well, there was a, if you are, if the, the easiest way is to sort of go, go stick with SQL because then it gives you the option to choose another product down the line. You're not stuck. You don't, if you go with a proprietary data access layer, then you have to rewrite it later on. If you go SQL, before you go for production, it's actually very quite easy to switch databases. Uh, switching databases in production is not that easy. Um, but you can still, you know, save, salvage a lot of code if you if you just move, say, from MySQL to Oracle or, or vice versa. Uh, this year in risk, and this is like what you prefer to to pay up front for design, development, and ongoing costs. Uh, the risk appetite is like, yeah, how is this a really critical application? If it's not a critical application, then let's play around with the new product. It's not a big deal. If it's a really critical app, you want to really uh, um, hold on to it as much as possible. PayPal uses Oracle. It's going to take, I think, quite a long time for the core systems, for the most critical core payment systems to be migrated. Uh, if I'm not, I'm not in charge of that, so that, you know, if ever, you know, it's it's very, it's because it's super high risk. It's like the benefit of of moving to another platform would be a lot smaller than the risk. Um, and I'm now okay, okay to fail and re platform if something goes wrong. Are you okay to get late night phone calls or something? Else? So you need to think all about that. And then you have also monitoring instrumentation. You know, a lot of mature products, you get a lot of things out of the box, really good alerts. Uh, a lot of the basic stuff, you know, a lot of the new products, they sort of, you know, they get, oh, let's go MVP, and then a lot of these nice features they tend to neglect. <coughs> Integration with existing APM tools, you know, you don't, a lot of the time, if you're in a big company, you have 
one APM tool that does everything, so we want to make sure that how, how well your product is supported with that. You know, and then the security, at least you want basic stuff. Uh, sometimes you want like PCI DSS, uh, like transparent encryption. Sometimes you want HSM support. Uh, some of them go like multi-tenancy support, which could be useful in some cases as well. And this is all kind of like the way I sort of made this list was, uh, by the way, was I looked at non-functional requirements and then used a few other things and it just sort of compiled this. So it didn't take it didn't take me too long, and it shouldn't take you too long to kind of at least do a first pass whenever you're doing a new project. And uh, and a few things when you're talking when you you know when you're talking to your vendors, you probably want to ask them a few questions. Well, about all of that, you know, say show me the money. Like, are you willing to actually put some money to say to uh, can you get some clawbacks if anything they claim during the pre-sales phase is not true. Uh, so you know that's a good test of how how good uh, their claims are, or show you know ask them to show you the evidence that that webs uh, that um, company Jepson that they do a lot of uh, all the tests they do are actually always public, so they always release everything. So you can always you can look for the evidence over there, or if it's some new vendor, you can try to ask them just to to go through something similar. And then also you can this is where it gets complicated instead of saying. Take, you take one platform like Oracle that does everything in an okay or good way. Maybe you want to separate it into two different platforms that are complementary. So you could, for example, take Cassandra and Spark. So Cassandra is good for OLTP inserts and and uh, small uh, reads, and then you have Spark for any big analytical workload. So you know, this few, it, it starts getting more complicated with modern databases. Yeah, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, and if, we, if you want open source, then it's all about how much support you can get and who's going to support you during the late night phone calls and panics. And a little bit of a joke. Yeah, it's sort of going a little bit back and forward. It's like even all the new vendors, this is what I find quite funny. You know, it's a uh, new SQL, like even the, a lot of no SQLs now, they actually put in some sort of a they kind of everyone realizes that a query language is actually useful in most cases. So some people try to say, "Oh, we're not quite SQL, but yeah, it's actually quite good." It's, so there's a bit of confusion there, and there's also new SQL products that I encourage you. I mean, if you do, really, if you really have scalability needs, if you're a really big company, I do encourage you to look at uh, a lot of these new SQL products. Of course, Google Spanner is one of the big ones, but there's there's an open source one. Patch of Phoenix, you know, there's a few other big vendors. CockroachDB is a bunch of guys that were working on Spanner. They, they created all their own company as well. And there's some interesting stuff. I don't have time to talk about it now, but we read all about it. And then we have next steps for you guys is to read those consistency models. You know, maybe you want to play with new SQL a bit. And, uh, you know, well, uh, tell me your pains, share between yourselves. It's, I'm sure a lot of people go great by the database. So. So good, thank you. Okay, and then the last thing is, you know, if everyone is saying consistency, this versus that, you know, uh, this one is the right one, this one's the wrong one, you probably, there probably is something to, to sell you, there's always ups and downs. And that's it, thank you very much. <laughs> we got two minutes of questions, quick questions. So what's the transaction uh, database that they pay about? Okay, cool. PayPal uses a few different, I mean, Oracle is still the big mainstay, but PayPal, they, they have, for the core systems they use, Oracle, they use, uh, the, oh, there are couches being used, uh, Cassandra is being used on the OLTP side, and Teradata is used on the back end, and Hadoop, you know, there are a lot of different things, but for the main data, critical databases, Oracle is still the, uh, the sort of your, uh, the workforce. So is it the big RNC? Yeah, yes, they use RAC is being used as correct. And it's, uh, it's still, uh, they still haven't migrated to 12 actually. Still, uh, so that tells you how long, how, how long it takes to keep, it takes a while, like any big move is risky, right? So it just tells you how risk averse big companies can How big is big? Hmm? How big is big? RAC. I actually don't know, the like it's complicated, there are a lot of different databases, so PayPal is already in a microservices kind of architecture, well it has some few monoliths and it's got some microservices, right, so it's, it's got, it has this huge 
monolith that was originally written by by Elon Musk and the gang, and then they tried to sort of the monolith is getting shrunk all the time, and then you still have microservices and that it's I, I don't know the exact figures actually. So it's not look I think for Amazon scale it's probably more or less than Amazon people. It's not it's doing you know you're doing a maximum few couple of hundred transactions a second. So it's not that huge. It, you're still talking, you know, is it petabytes, whatever, but I can't tell you the exact figure. Any other questions? No? Cool, that's it. And uh, I want a really big round of applause to the organizers because they're doing an amazing job. And it's all, it's all for free.